All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending this session, this set of, set of seminars from the UQ AI Collaboratory. Uh, firstly, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. UQ acknowledges the traditional owners and the and their custodianship uh, of the lands on which we meet. A lot of where we do our research and where we meet and teach all um, are in, uh, all due to um, our traditional owners. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. And thank you. Um, uh, to continue with uh, our AI seminar series, um, there will be um, a set of seminars that we have been ongoing throughout this year. And the purpose of these seminars are really to promote uh, inter or cross disciplinary AI research and collaboration. And AI is, uh, because AI is becoming such a central point in research in many areas, this is an opportunity for us to share those ideas. Um, and connection between UQ researchers, AI researchers, and students, and researchers across uh, in other disciplines is very important. And we'd like to in definitely engage in impact areas wherever we can. And so we have um, AI uh, health series of talks coming up. Um, and we've had uh, uh, a few already, and we're having one now, obviously. And so today we'll be looking at uh, the future of uh, precision and prevention for advanced melanoma. But in 19th of August, we also have AI in healthcare from bites to bedside uh, from Professor Ian Scott. So hopefully you can join us for that one. Uh, for today, though, um, I'm Shakes. Um, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm glad to be here today. I'm a senior lecturer at uh, the School of ITEE, uh, imaging and AI-related researcher. And today I'll be, uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Sawyer. Um, and Peter, uh, I've had the privilege to work with Peter over the last few years. And Peter is... Uh, an academic dermatologist with almost well, over 30 years of experience. He has 600 publications, 20, over $20 million in worth of uh, research funding. Uh, he's been a practitioner fellow of the NHMRC um, and has been awarded Center of, Ex Center of Research Excellence twice. Um, and his book is one of the uh, foremost uh, world-leading textbooks in the area. Um, and he's also the lead of the Australian Centre of Excellence in Melanoma Imaging and Diagnosis. And they have uh, recently been able to acquire a number of 3D imaging technologies, uh, of scanners, sorry, um, in which they will be scanning over a thousand patients a day in, uh, using 3D imaging. So, uh, exciting times, and Peter will hopefully tell us about all of these wonderful things. So, um, would you? I would like to please introduce uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so much, Shakes, and uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I have been a couple of times in this um, lecture hall, obviously, uh, for lectures for medical students, and. Uh, Um, we just have to change this, but it shouldn't be a big problem. A few of my, my colleagues from our department who wanted to come with me, they are down with COVID. <laughs> so I'm not sure if they would be able to, to be online. So it's uh, Joe is here with me, and I know a few of you, obviously, working with Alexander Rakic and, and Natasha and Tegan and so on. I mean, and and then I see guys here, which I can speak in my home language and even in, in my beloved Italian, because obviously I'm from a part of the world where 
Austria is just 20 kilo, uh, my hometown is just 20 kilometers apart from away from Italy. Anyhow, guys, uh, I like just to, for completeness, to say that I do have conflicts of, of, of interest. And uh, this is just important there, but my major conflict is obviously that I'm consultant of Camfield, the 3D total body imaging system. It's all obviously with UQ, with uh, this um, conflict registers and so on. And something which from my point of view is so important uh, that everything around artificial intelligence, it's a kind of a collaboration and multidisciplinary and multimodal collaboration. And, and basically in, in my case, my expertise is just the upper half, right? I mean, I'm, I'm by no means at all a, an artificial intelligence expert, no, I uh, have any ideas about mathematics and, and computer science. And I think this is uh, well, what, what we have tried to, to build up in the last years, this kind of collaboration with the people who really understand their domain. Yeah, And I think this is so important. And guys, you will know, obviously, those of you who are into, into chess, that you will know that when IBM developed the, the Deep Blue, yeah, they had, of course, AI experts, but they had quite a few grandmasters, yeah, in, in their turf, right? Whereas, on the other hand, Kasparov, who played against them, when off between the games, he had also AI experts who did basically, or computer scientists who did basically advise him. And you know that nowadays, Chess is so close linked to, uh, to to AI in an unbelievable way, right? So I think this is one of the beautiful opportunities which we have here at UQ, that we have really this multidisciplinary uh, approach. Let me just uh, start very shortly what is happening in the dermatology world. You know, I mean, I'm a dermatologist, also a dermatopathology back in Europe, but not, but not here. So, and this paper in 2017 was really the first one. And uh, it was actually from a quite a, a famous group. I'm not sure if some of you know about Sebastian Thrun. He's uh, originally a German superstar in the AI world. He had a role with Google X, I guess, and then he bought his own company. Interestingly enough, the head of school now of the, uh, of, uh, uh, Michael Brunig, he has a paper together with Sebastian Trun. Yeah, it's believe me or not. I mean, it, when I was asking him if he knows him, he was showing me that he has a paper with him. So it's it's relatively, it's a relatively small world. With all the other guys are from um, from Stanford. Yeah, and Stanford is still very proactive. Roberto is. Uh, He's a dermatopathologist, Susan Sweater, a senior dermatologist, Justin Coe, the dermatologist. And um, basically what, what they showed in this paper, and a relatively, I mean, small data set of melanoma and of demoscopic images, but they had thousands and thousands of cases, but just from all other dermatology. But they showed basically that the AI did as well as uh, expert dermatologists. And this paper was really then the first one in, in, in this specific uh, field. But then of course, uh, Google come into, into the game, right? Google, Google Health, yeah? And uh, they had an interesting paper, I'd just like to tell always a little bit of stories, yeah? Rainer Hoffmann Wellenhof, one of the middle authors, is a very close friend of mine and is basically now in charge of this division of the university in Graz, where I was in charge before I came to Australia. And the reason why he's invited is this, because we had a, 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 a former professor, also my, my teacher and mentor, he was obsessed with images in dermatology, right? So basically we had two professional photographers, yeah, two, and we had thousands and thousands and thousands of images, yeah? And there was a deal between the University of Graz and Google. Yeah, they have obviously for I think one million or two million euro. They have given them all the images, 
And the images are extremely well in, annotated because we have also uh, basically in all the cases, the pathology diagnosis, yeah? And because of this, Rainer was invited as a co-author, as a clinical advisor, despite the fact that for this study, they didn't use our data, yeah? It's quite interesting. I was asking Rainer, how many of our cases from Gaza did you use? Zero, zero. But just because the, the deal was, the commercial deal was in place, he was invited to be a, a, a co-author. Just to, 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 to share a little bit with you how important, of course, well annotated uh, data are. And going to, to, to results of this, they focused on a single diagnosis and then on differential diagnosis. And they provided then the accuracy from the top one diagnosis and the top three diagnosis, which uh, they did actually quite well. And then they compared uh, dermatologists with uh, GPs and with nurses and so on. And you see, of course, that uh, the results are, are pretty, pretty good. But what is most interesting is this, that in Europe in May 2021, they already basically released what uh, they did call, how they did call it, uh, derm assist, right? So they called it derm assist, which is basically a class one medical device. And it's intended for informational purposes only. And they make it clear that it doesn't provide a medical diagnosis. Yeah. And they claim that it works across all skin tones and skin types. And they aim to have a, identify more than 90% of the most commonly searched skin conditions. So they honed down in a little bit under 300 skin condition. Yeah. And what we understand, and, and Joe, you did some research, there is obviously no public update so far, and we cannot access it in Australia. Right. And it is obviously, obviously by design. And uh, I mean, this is obviously where the things are going. Uh, Monica and I self and the colleague from UQ at GP, Cliff Rosenthal, we, we have been then involved in this, um, one of the latest nature papers in this field about human computer collaboration for skin cancer recognition. And we did provide them a, a, a relatively small data set from a couple of hundred lesions, which they used then as a test set and where we had basically all confirmed diagnosis. And the system, how they did it, is actually quite interesting because they did made many data sets out of 30 lesions, right? So then they ask in the many, many individual dermatologists to assess these 30 lesions, independent, which has any information. But then obviously in the second step, you get the AI-based multi-class probability, you get the AI-based probability of malignancy, they had also this what they called content-based image retrieval, which from my point of view doesn't work at all. And actually they also showed it. And then they also provided the crowd-based multi-class probability. And what they also did say the time which then the clinician spent when they had this kind of um, feedback from the AI. And you see that in the moment when they get the content-based image retrieval, the time to answer gets much longer. And from my point of view, it also very clumsy. It doesn't really work. And then it shows that it's pretty equal between the, the levels, the colleagues and, and the AI. But what they did, they did one experiment, which was actually quite mean. Yeah, They provided faulty AI. So basically, let's say the lesion was a clearly melanoma. And if you look for the AI diagnosis, AI was saying benign, yeah? Or the other way around. And they did this sometimes correct and sometimes just to mislead you, yeah? And the result was this, that faulty AI was actually misleading the entire spectrum of clinician, including experts. And I recall, look, I mean, I know that a few younger colleagues were as good as a computer. So the computer had 26 out of 30, you know, and some of them were also 25, 26, 27. I usually was, despite my many, many years 
I was 22, 23, right? Because obviously the younger colleagues who did win against the computer, they spent hours and hours of training, right? Just to, to get better and so on. And, but I realized very well that sometimes, I think, and this is a clear cut basal cell carcinoma, clear cut, but then they say benign, you know? And what's going on? And they, <laughs> it's actually quite, quite interesting, right? And this is one of the problems, which of course, when AI comes into the clinical world, which we have to consider, right? What is if the AI is wrong for whatever reason, yeah? And I'm not sure if you have heard about this sort of experiments. I'm pretty sure that the same will be true in MRI and CT. Basically, this is the same lesion. It was just flicked around, yeah? With 90 degree. And yeah, in one case, it comes back as benign nevus, which is interestingly enough red in this slide. And then in the other cases, it's melanoma. So you wonder what's going on, yeah? With, uh, with, with AI, yeah? And I can't explain this. Uh, I just can refer that this was obviously published and this is something which, which happened, yeah? And then one of the big criticism on AI was it in dermatology that it was all trained on Caucasian skin, yeah? But this is also not true anymore. I mean, there are more and more papers out and, and studies where it is studied on, particularly on Asian skin, yeah? And this is a, a paper out of South Korea where they basically, they showed what, what is basically already known that uh, if you have dermatology resi uh, derm residents, yeah, this is uh, basically these are trainees, dermatology trainees. They are obviously much better than non-dermatology trainees, right? It, which is quite quite clear. They don't have consultant dermatologists here because obviously clinicians are very busy and it would be probably too expensive to invite them, at least in this setting, whereas in the Nature Medicine paper, the they way I'm invited, yeah. Uh, but this, I think the consultant would be maybe a little bit better than the residents, right? It's, but it's, it's basically a confirmation of, of, uh, of, of the other studies, right? And, and as I mentioned, they were, trained with data sets with majority of Caucasian and just recently Asian, Asian patients. And, and we have actually quite a specific interest on this because uh, we can, with our vector system, we can basically measure the pixel color automatically. Yeah. Uh, and we are comparing this and with um, conventional colorimeters. And it's, uh, it's one of the things where we are, quite sure that in the in the future you you basically if you image some, someone you can then easily distinguish between what we call facultative and constitutional skin tone or skin color and this is particularly in people who have a whiter skin and go in the sun you see a big difference right and it's uh it's quite interesting for example i have i mean I grew up in Europe, it was, but our sun is not as strong. I have, of course, more photo damage here than here, right? In the Australian context, the difference is much, much bigger. Interestingly enough, in some ladies, they have also the same degree of photo damage here. Mm -hmm. I was always thinking, what is why this is the case? But then Bridget is, uh, is our bioinformatician, actually a biostatistician who works closely with us. She just had a baby, otherwise she would be also here. She says, because when ladies are lying in the sun, they're flipping, you know? They're flipping, not everyone, but many are flipping their hands, you know? I'm lying like 10 minutes and then I do this because they want to have homogeneous pigmentation, right? And therefore, I was always wondering, I see 70, 80 year old Australian ladies and they have nearly the same photo damage here than here. Whereas in men, you never see it, right? Because men are not flipping their arms. You know, we are just doing other things, yeah? It's actually, I was quite uh, pleased uh, by this. So skin of color is a big topic, you know, with all these dis uh, differentiations. Then there are on the international uh, 
space going on, this international skin imaging collaboration, all um, basically out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And there is a combination of, of, of academia and industry. Uh, you see photo finder, you see kitware, you see uh, obviously campfield here, but then you see a lot of universities and so we have to make sure that we have the version where our medical university of Graz is not here because if Rainer would be here, he was already jumping up because Graz is also part of it, but we have an old version where we forgot the Austrians anyhow, but Queensland is of course part of it. And we were actually leading and Bridget was mostly the work of, of, of Bridget, but also Chantal was involved and, and, and a few others of our teams. We provided material for a, for a challenge, yeah? And this was a challenge where uh, I think it's, prepare, uh, it's having every year kind of an IT challenge, right? Where they provide material to AI groups all over the world. When they started in 2016, there were 23 AI groups participating. On this in 2020, there were 3,000 AI groups. And I think uh, Shakes, you and others, you, you participated, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure, and you had actually a very good, good result, but by 3,000 participants, you know, it's, uh, the, the differences are minimal, right? 95.8%, 95.6%, you had 95.4% or whatever, right? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And we were looking in the contextual uh, context, several lesions of a given person, and within the dermatology community, I would always say, guys, where is the melanoma? And then if you say, okay, we separate this, these are two patients, yeah? So basically these slides are coming just from two patients, and you see in the patients on the left, they all look pretty bad, whereas in the patient on the right, just one sticks out. This is the concept then of ugly dugly and Natasha, I think you have a bit of experience in this context, right? Uh, a little bit is uh, probably an understatement but because Natasha is doing her PhD on this sort of things. And it's obviously quite interesting and, and there are quite a few publications in this context already. I'd just like to share you now so daily examples from dermatology that you then imagine, even if you would have or you have the AI diagnosis, how complex it is, yeah? And, and this is obviously a rather typical Australian uh, patient, a lady who has several moles. Actually, if you see with our total body nevus count, more than 700 over two millimeter and so on. I mean, immense numbers, yeah? And these are all now the slides which are from this person, and we have all dermoscopy, right? And you see now the problem which we as clinicians have, but at the end of the day, also the AI has. Where is now the melanoma? And we're not. And, and um, from a clinical point of view, um, I just take out five lesions. All these five lesions have been excised. So we have from all these five lesions a histopathologic diagnosis. And if you read then the diagnosis, you wonder what's going on, yeah? Because to my eye, clinically, it's all more or less the same, right? And you see that the histopatholo histopathology is different. Then, of course, you see what is the histopathology fault. I mean, there's a big problem with histopathology. Yeah? Different, it's just a diagnosis made by human based on the expertise. The experts in pathology, there are also registrars in pathology, there are community pathologists. So it's well known that 10% of melanocytic proliferations, there are different levels of diagnosis. And then, of course, by the way, AI in pathology will be a, a big issue. And this is something where we are also embarking because we want to com combine it, AI in pathology with AI in, uh, in the clinical and, in, and imaging world. But I'd like just now to focus on one of these uh, examples and the example in the in the right lower um, part of the slide, which is basically, actually, I don't have this here now, right? Is, there, is this not the, not the 
correct. No, we, we have not here. Anyhow, to make the, sh the story short, and I think I did intentionally not showing here because it's quite graphic. This lesion was excised, yeah? And the diagnosis was, as you can hear, read, high grade, moderately to severe dysplastic nevus. But it was close to the margin, so it was re-excised. In the re-excision, the diagnosis was a cytomelanoma, so it was excised a second time. And then at the end, the third time, and her scar basically goes from, from here to here. She had an extremely large scar because obviously the pathology was always having an incytomelanoma because there was not a correlation with the clinical setting. Yeah, Because the, the joke which I like to make and just to make it clear, this is a bit of a joke, but I think if 50% of these lesions are excised, they were all in cytomelanoma. And this is in the, the issue of overdiagnosis, which is a big issue in medicine. And Ian Scott, who will, who will speak in one of the series, he is one of the experts in overdiagnosis in medicine, not in the dermatology field, but in general, it's a very big issue, right? That basically lesions clinically and and sometimes also histologically are diagnosed as in cytomelanoma, but they behave absolutely benign. And if the lesion wouldn't be excised, the person would live 30 more years. Having said this, then there's also the fear of underdiagnosis with all this issue of medical legal pressure. And I'd like to share you now a second example, which is a, a young uh, lady. She had a few in cytomelanoma, quite a few moles. And you see immediately, if you look at this kind of overview, they look, look, look much benign all these lesions, right? And not the degree of photo damage which you saw before, yeah? And photo damage obviously is something which then has to be taken into consideration with the AI also. But then there's a question how you basically grade it. But you will still see that a few lesions are sticking out, yeah? So this lesion here, but it didn't change the budget as a different color. And all these other lesions also didn't change during follow-up because we do a lot of uh, longitudinal follow-up. Also here, no change, no change here. This lesion, we decided then to excise it. Also the change is basically minimal to not present. And, uh, it was then assigned out as a, as a benign lesion, yeah? And, but then we go back to these five lesions, but then this was my, my patient and I was, I mean, not patients, it was a study participants, yeah? So we are looking every six months on her lesions, but we always do a kind of a, what we call lesion reviews with my younger colleagues. And we provide feedback when we think a lesion needs to be excised, yeah? In this case, for me, all was fine, but then a lesion was excised and turned out to be a melanoma. And you wouldn't never guess it, yeah? Because the lesion who was then turned out to be a melanoma was this lesion here, yeah? Can you imagine, yeah? And, and what is the problem here? Yeah, I mean, obviously this lesion was on a body side, which the patient saw. She's very anxious because she had several melanoma. And then of course, the patient is anxious to the dermatologist, what's going on here? The dermatologist is also anxious not to miss a melanoma, right, for medical legal purposes, yeah? So then he says, okay, let's cut it out. You see here, this lesion has not, not changed, yeah? And we have, um, and this is just uh, the highly, highly magnified uh, clinical image, right? There is no change. And then interestingly enough, if you read the pathology, it was done as atypical junctional antigenous melanocytic nevus or proliferation. And after immune histochemistry, it was upgraded to an in cytomelanoma. And then of course, there was a re-excision done because it was close to the margin. And this is what I mean with overdiagnosis, right? Because of course I have shown this to many colleagues, dermatologists and also colleague pathologists. Everyone tells me, Peter, if this is a melanoma, 
we, yeah. And this is one of the problems, of course, where I think the AI will probably not call this a melanoma. Also the change module will not call it as a change, right? Still the clinician may, may excise it as in this case. And then if the pathology is, let's say done by a community pathologist who is also um, more prone or has medical legal fears and all these sort of things, right? So these are quite interesting challenges, yeah? So, and from my point of view, what we via our consortium will be able to do is basically to correlate the, this is this lesion here, the reddish one, right? To correlate it with the histopathology, yeah? And this is certainly will bring a new new dimension into this game. And of course, we will also correlate it with clinical uh, data, number of moles, degree of photo damage, skin color. Theoretically, also in many, many of our study participants, we have also genetic data from the germline genetic. Yeah. Do they have melanoma genes? Do they have nevus genes? And obviously then to go into, into, into the, the pathology. And here we have also then projects with our immunologists, immunopathologists to basically uh, study the interaction between the lymphocytes and the, and the nevus cell, cell slash melanoma uh, cells. And in this case, by the way, uh, this is a part of a project uh, where it was seen by four pathologists and they had Two were thinking it's a nevus, one was thinking question mark, and the, the fourth was saying this is already a superficial melanoma. So it is, uh, then of course in the clinical setting, it's very easy. Basically you always say superficial melanoma, you take the versus and you do a re-excision. But as a scientist, you obviously want to, to go into the, more into the truth. So the question is of course, where, the clinical decision making will be enhanced by artificial in intelligence. And together with Monica, we, we wrote an editorial and we were thinking a little bit to which extent the clinical, assist, uh, clinical assessment should become before the AI analysis. And this is obviously where I like then really to hear the discussion, how you do it in, in the CT and in the MRI, you know, how this is the, the standard, because this is, of course, there are pros and cons, uh, and I somehow favor this workflow, right? Because you're the clinician making umpires, and then the AI kicks in, and then you can think, ah, okay, this I might have overlooked, yeah? And you take on the AI, or you don't take it on, but you make a an independent bias assessment. But of course, the other way around, the AI is for the clinician, then you would probably see just those lesions who are suspicious, yeah? And uh, then you are biased, but it's a triage system. It reduces the assessment time, uh, highlights just concerning lesions. I mean, for busy clinicians, they prefer the, the second one, yeah? So I think it's it's, it's probably will go more in the second direction. And this is just an example to what will already, it's already happening now. There are a few systems in place, which basically within a couple of seconds provide a AI diagnosis, right? And they can provide it either benign malignant or they provide it in, in, in percentages, yeah? And this is what actually Kahoo is doing in New Zealand, uh, which is a, a AI company. Um, I just like to share with you, I mean, this is all make, made up, right? This is my lower leg. I have this lesion, which is 100% dermatofibroma for 20 years, the lesion didn't change, yeah? Sometimes it's irritated from when, when I'm walking with, with mountain shoes, right? But otherwise it's completely, didn't change, yeah? A dermatofibroma is basically a fibrotic insect bite. You have an insect bite, and then there comes some fibrosis, and then it stays forever there. And I did make up 1% of small plastic melanoma, which is a very bad type of melanoma. So what do you do if, you, if this gives you the AI, right? Are you still excising it and 
with all the problems. So these are then the clinical questions. Who then overrules the AI? The clinician, of course, yeah. Who takes the responsibility if you don't take, if the AI is right and you overrule the AI? It's another question, right? And then everyone can say, you idiot, why didn't you take the, the advice from the AI, right? So in what way will AI be integrated? And this is now I'm coming to the end of my talk. Just a few more or less jokes, right? This is how I look without glasses. And when I look at the patient, this is when I look with glasses, yeah? And this is when I look with augmented reality glasses, yeah? And then probably I have already the diagnosis here, everything. I mean, I know that this works already in manufacturing, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, it is happening, right? If you have a highly specialized worker somewhere, I mean, it's not, they, they can't always be there in, in, uh, in, in rural and remote areas. And then this is a discussion. I think we can discuss a little bit at our, round table about this. Uh, I obviously feel very strongly that as a clinician in your respective field uh, domain, yeah, we should be in, in, involved, yeah. But then, of course, there are famous saying from famous AI guys that you don't need to become radiologists anymore, right? You will know this and and actually, there's a lot of fear about, among radiologists that they think that they will be replaced. Yeah. So this is uh, this is certainly a big uh, discussion, and and then the timeline for AI integration. I mean, it depends. In many of these um, video systems which we have on the market, AI is already integrated in the hidden button because they are not approved, not FDA approved. And of course, uh, the manufacturer don't want to take the risk. So you have to take a button and then they tell you 10 times and say, you know, doesn't really take any risk. Anyhow, and yes, and, and Joe did make this beautiful drawing, right? Which I think it's quite nice. I give you 70% chance of melanoma. And then uh, you go to, uh, to a GP and he says 70% and he says, go see a dermatologist and the dermatology says 70%, but ask a pathologist. And I mean, this is of course a joke, but in, in difficult lesions and one or two I showed you, this is really the case, right? This is not a joke. This is actually, <laughs> it's actually uh, reality. Yeah. So guys, I'm at the end of my talk and I'm very happy for, for, uh, for a discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, many eye-opening uh, points that I saw, at least several that were eye-opening to me, um, especially with regards to how we as AI experts kind of look at one end of the technical spectrum trying to get high accuracy, but what does all of that mean and how do we, how do we integrate it into, into actual practice? So um, I think what we'll try to do now is to go for questions. And I'm not sure if we have any, there's none on the system as yet. Um, ask the audience, yes? Yep. Thanks, Prof Sawyer. Um, one of my thoughts that I had when listening to that very interesting presentation is uh, the basics of the ABCDEs of melanoma and we go to the evolving. What capacity do you see for predictive models? So uh, how much input would we need for say one, two, three, perhaps images taken over separate time intervals that might then give us some confidence to predict or have a predictive model around whether that is likely to become a lesion of concern over time. Mm. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tegan. It's actually a very, a very good question, and I'd just like to to share one picture with you and 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 talk then a little bit uh, about this. Uh, in in the clinical world, we 
if we speak of melanoma and neva, it's always a question, uh, is the lesion elevated or not? Yeah, and this, of course, is difficult, but still you can assume if you look at an image like this, this is a, a nodule. And if this is a nodule and this would be a melanoma, it would be already very deep and very bad, yeah? Whereas when the lesions are the other lesions, which you saw, they're all completely flat. And when they're completely flat, it usually takes a while till they get invasive. And you easily can image them for three months or for six months, and then basically see if they're getting larger, if they're changing color, and so on. With nodular lesions, it's getting quite tricky, yeah? Because this is already now, a, if it would be a melanoma, a bad melanoma, and if you wait now three months or six months, it would be even thicker and even would get a better melanoma. And here is the problem with these nodular lesions, which are often, particularly in people who have a, a very fair skin and have the red hair gene, these lesions are often uh, not pigmented. There is what we call amelanotic. They have a reddish color, a whitish color. And this makes it extremely complicated. And we have a lot of what we call differential diagnosis. A normal pimple who is a little bit inflamed, yeah? And because it's inflamed, it probably was squeezed or whatever, may mimic an amelanotic melanoma. So you have to see, of course, but this is now a guy who is a, let's say a cab driver and sitting the whole day. And he has many, what we call pimples on the whole back or we call it folliculitis. Then of course, it's a different clinical setting. And this is someone who has no pimple, but just one lesion, yeah? Which is nodular and amelanotic. And so there are quite a few examples and usually, when you then hear with patients who had this very bad melanoma, there's always a story behind it that the doctor thought it's a benign cyst or a benign, what we call seborrheic keratosis or something banal, yeah? And they don't do an image, you know? And to be honest, these things, obviously, when you work over decades, these things have also happen, happened to me, right? The, that... I mean, the melanomas, they're clear-cut cases of melanoma, which I didn't show you here, yeah? They're clear-cut cases of melanoma where basically everyone recognizes it, but some of them are quite tricky. And this is then basically the issue of out-of-the-domain lesions in, 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 in our case, where then, of course, when AI once sees this, it probably will recognize it. But uh, if the AI hasn't seen it yet, it may not be recognized. And um, the APCD is a different issue. I think the APCD is basically integrated probably most in the AIs. And I mean, depends if it's supervised or unsupervised and how you, you define it, right? But the problem are really these nodular lesions and some absolutely benign neva, many are also nodular, right? Elevated, but still they're absolutely Banal. And you will often see people on, on the face with some skin colored lesions. These are all benign neva, yeah? But uh, it's, it can be actually quite, quite tricky. And of course, then uh, this is always the issue with the sensitivity versus specificity, right? If you excise every lesion, yeah, let's go to, to this example here, which, which I had before, yeah? If you excise uh no wait a moment let me let's go let's go here if you excise every every of these lesions yeah everything you will have 100 percent sensitivity because you will get all melanomas but the specificity will go down to probably two or three percent and how can you excite i mean surgeon can do everything right and, and I have also pictures in my collection where surgeon did big flaps to get rid of many moles, but in the daily life, you, you can't do it, yeah? And this is then this challenge, this kind of, uh, between sensitivity and specificity. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, 
first is that DJ by film about one of the first studies that we showed us. Uh, it was the study that uh, had the multiple type of AI uh, assistance uh, yeah. techniques. Uh, yeah. And that one that was content based image retrieval. Yeah. So I uh, was curious about that work. Uh, my understanding from that uh, uh, slide that you showed us, uh, the second one, the, the next one, um, is that the data they looked at uh, um, time to take a decision yeah. as the time to answer as, as the principal metric. But I was wondering if that time to answer correlated also with the correctness of them. Ah, right? yes, it's actually a, a very good point. I'm pretty sure that they have done this and they have looked at this. And I'm pretty sure that there was no 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 difference, yeah, or not. But it's a, it's a very good point because I, when I hear your question correctly, you say, doesn't matter if it's more time, if then the diagnosis is more correct, right? It, it, yeah. I, more time, but you get the correct diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. I prefer you spend more time. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I understand this, but it's, uh, it's. I'm pretty sure that it was not the case, and particularly the the, the problem was these uh, images which were selected. They are basically often all over the place. You know what I mean? If the question is, this is an evil of a melanoma, and if you see then 20 images, where in 15 of them, you also don't know if this is an evil of a melanoma, then it's not not helpful. Yeah. And so we had to do Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure they did, but I, I'm pretty sure that there was it was not better because otherwise they would have clearly reported about it. Yeah. Question is uh, uh, more a high level question. Um, so, you, you, towards the end of your presentation, uh, you ended up saying, uh, um, well, you stress multiple times how, uh, what should a clinician do if the eye is saying uh, uh, these are suspected melanoma, and but the clinician might think this is not a melanoma, what they should do, and they have legal responsibility and so on. And I, I was wondering, isn't this the same? That you currently face with any type of diagnostic tool, any type of medical instrumentation, you know, you you get a blood, you're a doctor, you get blood results. One doctor look at it, thinks well, all is good. Another doctor looks at it, it might get some suspicion, and uh, and again, you are not failing a doctor because uh, on something that looked. Uh, normal they haven't uh, reacted right and so similarly uh, you know with ai i think it's just another tool that you have uh, at your disposal but is not a a better tool than than yeah, no no i i uh, thank you good i think the the point is well taken and uh, i think i i see where you are coming it's just in the in the dermatology world particularly in the very specific question, if it's a melanoma or not, there's a lot of medical legal fear and angst from the patient and also from, from the doctor. And then of course, this depends also a little bit from the, um, interestingly enough, from the level of experience, but also interestingly enough of the, uh, of the, of the younger colleagues are much more careful because when I say, look, from my point of view, this is a seborrheic keratosis, a little bit irritated, we do nothing. Then they say, okay, Peter, you are close to retirement. It's easy for you to say it because obviously you are now senior and, and probably no one will speak up, but I, I wouldn't like to, to take this risk because I'm the beginning of my career and I don't want to. And, and you know, these are the sort of, 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 of rationale. And then of course, um, but I see the point. And this is what actually I think radiologists and, and clinicians are doing with radiology images and so every, every day. And I think this is certainly something where I think what we have not yet done is to discuss these things really in detail with uh, healthcare providers. And this is one of the reasons why I mentioned that I'm so interested in the work what Nicole Hartley did, because I think 
there is a lot what we can learn as a dermatology discipline. Dermatologists are basically one of the reasons why I and, and, and a few senior dermatologists are so keen on this, because dermatology was in the last years falling behind the technology curve, right? And I sometimes make jokes, particularly in front of dermatologists, guys, we are 20, 30 years behind radiology as a discipline, because dermatologists, they look and they say, yes, okay, we do this and that, you know what I mean? But there are many dermatologists even afraid to make photographic documentation of moles because, you know, I can be sued if I miss something, you know what I mean? So it's, it's a kind of a different culture. Yeah, and to over overcome cultural changes within a discipline is not is not that easy. But but thanks for mentioning this. It's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. So um, Peter, we've got a, a really good question. Um, I was thinking the same thing. Can we? Would it be possible to use full spectrum imaging? So multiple pictures, different frequencies of light. Uh, obviously have different properties, maybe more penetration into the skin. Uh, that kind of something that's been explored. It, it, indeed, it has been explored. And this is, a, there's even a book written about this. This was an American company who did, uh, had a great IPO, yeah, Melafind, and they had multispectral imaging. And they had actually, they have done fantastic clinical studies, yeah and all sort of, of work. And they had a very significant, uh, I think they had a sensitivity of 96.5%, but their specificity was 9%, right? And, and, and then they went on the market, they had some very good um, outlines, what can be imaged and what's not, but then there was no uptake, yeah? And the company ultimately defaulted, yeah? And it's uh, the, the then CEO who did basically get this FDA approval. He didn't even write a book about it. So I, I, I remain, it's exciting from a research perspective, but I remain skeptic about this. From my point of view, the correlation with the pathology, with consensus diagnosis of pathology, with AI and pathology, and taking into consideration the clinical yeah, uh, parameters will be more important. And this is, by the way, what we are trying within our consortium, which I didn't speak today. This would be a, a completely different talk, but this is where I think it will go. The other thing is, of course, what we are doing with, uh, with Alex and his team into terahertz imaging, but this is very, very early days. And we are looking at molecular signatures, but um, I think it's too early to make any comment on, on this. Yeah, so um, we do have one more question, but unfortunately uh, there's classes uh, that will start very soon. So we do have to vacate the, the lecture theater. So thank you very much for everyone in attending. Uh, really appreciate it. There's one more talk, as I mentioned before, on the 19th of August. Uh, you'll be able to find the details later. Um, but once again, we can thank Peter for a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.